Hello, everyone. I'm very grateful to the organizers for the opportunity to present at the Bernoulli MS Symposium. First, I would like to thank my collaborators, uh, Thierry Dijkstra, Mingyu Yang, Yusuke Murayama, and Nikos Logothetis from the MPI Institutes here in Tübingen. Today, I would like to describe some particular problems in uh, analysis of electrophysiological time series and how we approach them. First, what are the electrophysiological time series? Electric activity is captured at different scales, and each of them is useful to characterize distinct phenomena. Electroencephalography most frequently captures the data from the scalp, uh, far away from the neural cells that perturb the electric field. Local field potential reflects superimposed activity of tens of thousands of cells and is captured in vivo. Multi-unit activity, or MUA, is obtained using the same experimental recording setup as the local field potential, meaning it's captured within the same time series as LFP. But the use of the signal is to understand activity of individual cells. Because a time series captures the dynamic electric field at a point in space, could be useful to understand its origin. The simplest possible way to think about it is that a current source, SI, is downscaled by distance to the recording channel. All contributions to extracellular field are inversely weighted by distance to the electrode and superimposed. So same activity has different scale in the time series, depending on the position of the electrode relative to the membrane. At the same time, over a few last decades, the recording technology has evolved from a simple tetrode, which was an invention particularly to facilitate the scaling law for multi-unit activity analysis, to higher density probes with a precise positioning of the channel and a brush array. The latter case is a particularly interesting because after implantation, the channels are spread in a brain structure at random, effectively supplying the data analyst with a large number of random interchannel distances. Here are two major things we usually want to know when analyzing this time series. From the local field potential in some particular brain structures, we can find out brain states, such as stages of sleep, uh, analyzing the time series at around a minute time scale. Concurrently with that, and remember that this could be, in some cases, the, even the same time series, we want to identify how many cells have contributed to multi-unit activity, usually uh, at a millisecond time scale. Looking at it in more detail, suppose a single channel electrode is positioned next to two neurons, one of them slightly further away. Each of the two neurons keeps spiking at random times. While individual spike shapes could be very similar to each other, the electrode, when immersed in the brain structure tissue, is practically positioned with some special randomness relative to the neurons. This plays to the hands of the data analyst, who, because of the downscaling of the potential by distance, can use this to discriminate between neurons. Usually it goes like this. We identify time windows, then treat, treating them as vectors, apply a dimensionality reduction algorithm, and finally apply a clustering algorithm, assuming that distinct shapes of waveform captured within the same time windows correspond to distinct neurons. What we should note from this is that this computational pipeline of diverse methods in the end serves to obtain a spatial temporal characterization of the electric field around the electrode. Because of what is said above, we want to propose a more streamlined procedure. First, we want to find a way uh, to account for an increasing number of recording channels on modern electrodes. And second, we want to find out if we can characterize uh, extracellular the extracellular field on average. That is assuming some finite recording period within the same experimental condition. For this, we attempt to facilitate a relatively new field of topological data analysis. And now I will try to briefly introduce a number of concepts from it. First off, a simplicial complex K is a topological space that can be defined by taking subspaces of a finite set, such that if one set sigma is chosen to be part of the space, then its subset called simplices are also taken to be part of simplicial complex. Next, we define a space of K chain CK as a vector space for simplicity with Z2 coefficients by taking linear combinations of all simplices of, in each dimension. Simplex dimension is just the number of elements in the simplex. Taking the simplex, we can define its boundary delta as a sum of its k-dimensional subsimplices. One way to think about it is to imagine a triangle embedded in Euclidean space together with its interior. Then its boundary is simply its set of edges, and this generalizes to arbitrary dimensions. 
For every simplex dimension k, we have a vector space of k chains and define a linear map between spaces of consecutive dimension by taking a sum of its faces boundaries. The key property of a boundary map delta is that its consecutive composition is trivial. This suggests to look at a chain complex, which is a sequence of boundary maps between spaces of k chains. Some elements of the image of delta k plus one would also be in the kernel of delta k. Then uh, we could define a homology group as a quotient, kernel delta mod image delta k. These notions are in fact older than the probability axioms and have found much generalization and applications in mathematics and physics over the course of the century. Yet in the early 90s, there started to grow an increased interest in the computational aspects of homology theory. And it was around 2000 that they began to find more use in data analysis when persistence homology was introduced. Here's some intuition. <clears throat> Betty numbers, which are the ranks of homology groups, have a topological interpretation. In zeroth dimension, they count the number of connected components of a topological space. In first dimension, the number of linearly independent non-contractible loops, and in second dimension, the number of holes in the space. And this generalizes to an arbitrary dimension. Now, if you take a function, uh, like on the left picture here, you can look at its sublevel sets. Consider the function as a topological space, but take all points below a certain value. Then you count and track the number of connected components as this value increases. For example, between values B and C, you have two connected components, but between C and D, you only have one. Hence, you can notice that Betty zero uh, changes only at critical points. And you can think of characterizing functions by tracking the change in homology groups. More generally, uh, you can consider a real valued function, F on a topological space X, and define a sublevel set filtration as a set of all subspaces given by pre-images of the function below each of its values alpha. All pre-images are linked by an inclusion map. Once we construct a simplicial complex K for each of the uh, F alphas, we can obtain a chain complex via inclusion of chain spaces. The inclusion maps between chain complexes induce homomorphisms G between homology groups. Hence, we can track how homology groups change as a function of alpha. It turns out that they change at critical points of a filtered function f. When the change happens, we say that an element of a homology group is born at value alpha one, it dies at value alpha two. Hence, to numerically summarize a filtered function, we keep track of these changes by recording beta numbers in a canonical way. If an element dies when passing a critical value, an older element remains. A filtered function is summarized by a collection of real valued intervals counted with multiplicity. All birth death values uh, as points on the Euclidean plane together with the diagonal at which birth equals death uh, define a persistence diagram that can be further treated in data analysis. First, we want to quantify distance between diagrams by optimally matching points of two diagrams and respecting the dimension of the homology birth death intervals. Using this distance, we can show that persistence diagrams of two functions in bottleneck distance are closer than the functions in L infinity norm. This is very useful because adding some noise to one of the functions changes their diagram in a controlled way. There are other forms of stability theorems and persistence, and in fact, this research is ongoing. In order to statistically analyze persistence diagrams, it's useful to represent it in a vector space. This research on summary functions for a persistence homology is also ongoing, but one of the first notions called the persistence landscape was introduced and studied by Peter Bubenik. I give references uh, used in this uh, that, that I used to prepare this presentation at the end of the slides. To compute a landscape, you introduce a family of piecewise linear functions supported by the diagonal of the persistence diagram. The peak of each function is centered at a point of a diagram and has height equal to the distance to the diagonal. The bigger the height of the peak, the longer the homology element has lived in the filtration, or we say it's more persistent. Persistent landscapes respect the dimension of the homology. 
Finally, I show preliminary results from a method that uses these notions to analyze data. To recall, this is an example situation from, uh, for uh, analyzing electrophysiological time series. We have collection of neurons at unknown positions in physical space. And we also have a point set of channels with a known arrangement, for example, on the plane in case of a tetrode. From each channel's time series, we obtain time windows synchronously. If we take a time window from one voltage trace, we also take corresponding one from all other channels. The goal is to derive a special temporal statistic that characterizes the electric field on average under a constant experimental condition. We do this with the following algorithm. Taking all time windows, we triangulate a point set of channels. Each time window is a one-dimensional function, but if channels are closed, the data must only differ slightly. Also, higher dimensional homologies of one-dimensional functions are trivial, and hence it's worth grouping nearby channels. We do so by considering them as vertices in a triangulation. Taking a tensor product of functions allows to construct a random sample from a four-dimensional field. We then compute persistence homology of each sample. An empirical average landscape across all samples is then interpreted as a state of the extracellular field within an experimental condition. Here go some examples, first with simulated data. These are two neurons with stochastic spiking times. Because the data is simulated, the spike times are known and we can extract the time windows to test the algorithm. Suppose these two neurons are recorded with four channels of a tetrode, each at a random distance from the neurons that defines the scaling coefficients. But the second neuron in this example uh, is further away from all channels than the first neuron. Consider one sample from a three-dimensional field obtained from just a single window when we know that the first neuron has spiked. We'll look at persistence diagrams of the sample. The red dots represent zero-dimensional persistence homology, Blue dots, one-dimensional persistence homology, and green dots correspond to uh, the uh, two-dimensional, or uh, you can think about it as finding holes in that uh, random sample. And uh, this is also the highest homological dimension one can have in a 3D field. Uh, the bottom diagram represents a sample from a second neuron that is further away from the electrode. In the simulation, all spike shapes are same other than being downscaled by distance. This is why, as we expect, the resistance diagrams are similar with little variation due to minimal level of noise in the series, in the time series. However, the length of birth death intervals strongly differs. This is easier seen in the state statistic. The average landscape of a first neuron is much larger in amplitude than that of the second one despite them having an overall similar shape. On this plot, I only show a few of the two-dimensional landscape functions. Due to the small number of samples in this, particularly for the first neuron in this example, the average landscape has not yet converged to the mean. Another similar example, uh, different neurons can produce spike shapes at similar times, which is a, a known situation in multi-inductivity analysis. Spikes of all neurons are superimposed on each electro channel. This might make it difficult to assign time windows that have an overlap to any particular neuron. However, when we look at the state statistic, we might hope that the overlapping windows may average in landscape. So that if there is a small number of overlaps, it won't be detected. But if there is a consistent overlap, it may instead be reflected in the time average Final example is from real data. Like in simulation, two neurons were recorded for channels of an electrode arranged on the plane and spike sorted by human expert colleagues. Like before, the top row corresponds to neuron one and the bottom row to neuron two. Different columns correspond to different channels. Note that the waveforms in this data set have three critical points. Uh, two maxima and not just one like it was in the simulated data. This generates a bigger number of loops and uh, holes in the tensor product. 
during the application of the algorithm. And in the real data waveforms from different neurons at, uh, at one channel are not just rescaled, but also differ by width. We apply the algorithm to this data set. We triangulate the channel positions, take a tensor product of waveforms to construct a 3D random sample, compute persistence landscape of each, and look at the average state. Here we see a distinct shape of a set of landscape functions, uh, distinct from the simulation for each of the two neurons. Plotted are only several two-dimensional landscapes, and despite similar shapes, some differences in M so, uh, some difference in amplitude that we saw with the time windows is also reflected in the time average. The distance from neurons to electrode channels was not controlled in this case, though in practice an electrophysiologist attempts to place one channel as close as possible to one neuron. In summary, we have shown one way to characterize a dynamic electric field measured at a finite number of positions in extracellular space. In this, we have utilized the arrangement of the measurement points and relied on tools from topological data analysis. We have also shown some preliminary examples on real and simulated data, how a state statistic can be used for the analysis of multi-unit activity. Two things would be, two next things would be to more rigorously test classification performance and perhaps to derive a hypothesis test for comparing two different states. Another very curious venue is to study asymptotic behavior upon channel density increase. I thank you for attending my talk and here I leave you with the references that I used in preparation.